Good morning. We're so excited to see you guys this morning. If you'll go ahead and stand and sing with us.
You may be seated. Welcome to Mission Point. We're so glad that you're here this morning. If this is your first time, hopefully you got a guest packet on the way in. Inside that guest packet is a visitor's card. If you could fill that out and drop it in our offering box just outside the auditorium so that we can have a record of your visit, we would appreciate that. We're so glad you're here today. And so uh, a couple of quick announcements before we get back into our praise and worship. Miss Timothy, you want to tell us about our... So today is five trunk or treat, and we're still so excited, even though it's going to rain, we're going to do trunks in the gym. So if you signed up already to do a trunk, um, you'll have a table and chairs. Um, if you didn't, because you were like, oh, I don't really want to be outside, well, we're inside now, and we can set up a table for you, and you can come and pass out candy. So we're going to have trick-or-treating, we're going to have apple ciders and donuts, um, we'll have a photo booth, so... Invite your friends, invite your family, invite strangers. Um, we do need some help after service today. Um, we need to put some tables in the gym. So if you are able to help us with that, that would be great. Um, and tonight afterwards, we're going to need to take everything back. So if you could help afterwards. Trunk or treats from 4 to 530. I don't know if I said that, but just in case. Um, but I hope you guys are all here and we're really excited. Did you tell them when they want the tables to be here? 3.30? Okay. If you have a table, if you could be here by 3.30 to set up, that would be great. So we can start right at 4. All right. And if you, I'm, not gonna, I'm not done yet. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> this, like, is, I maybe should take notes. Um, if you have, if you're doing a trunk and you're coming early, if you could park, not, like, not this side of the parking lot, but over here, like, and come in the teen room doors, that would be great so that we can, I mean, there's not a lot of parking over there, so until it's filled, if you could park over there so that we can park our guests over here. Thank you. I'm really done now. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Tiffany. Hey, just a, uh, one quick announcement. The new list for our Sunday school breakfast is up, so if you were on the last list, you're probably on this list. So go take a picture of it with your phone so you know when your Sunday is so you don't forget. Uh, if you'd like to participate, let me know or Scott Jr., Scott Sauter Jr. That way we can get you on the list or uh, uh, something of that nature so that you can help participate. And I got one quick thing that I, I want to do before uh, we get back into our praise and worship. I want to ask Nolan, if you come up here for a second, please. This is my buddy Nolan. This is the congregation, congregation, Nolan. So. He is a student at Ashland University. And so Nolan, he, he looked us up online, looked at our doctrine. He said, hey, this is a place that has uh, similar beliefs that I believe. I'd like to go fellowship with him. He came. He's been here for a little over a month, maybe. And so what Nolan's doing is he's going to Ashland University. He's getting into the medical field because God has called him to medical missions. Amen. Okay, and what I want to do is, we're, we're, this is Missions Emphasis Month, right? So what we do is we focus on missions, and we focus on giving to missions, missionaries that are going out, missionaries that are already on the field, all those things. But what I want to do is I want to be proactive. Here we have a gentleman who's going through school right now, and God has called him somewhere to the Middle East, right? Something like Northern Africa or Iraq, Afghanistan, somewhere where the church is persecuted. God is putting him right in the middle of that. That's, he's giving him a burden for those places. And so what I want to do is I want to be proactive. I want to say, Nolan, if the Lord is willing, and I'm still pastor here at Mission Point, we want to be the first church to support you as a missionary as you begin to uh, gain support and go out and to uh, raise support for your mission field. We want to be that first church. So I want to be proactive. I wanted to bring him up here so you could see his smiling little face and that you could pray for him by name, by faith, by where he is going and doing medical missions. Who knows what God has? Uh, God may open a different door. We don't know, but we just want to be praying for folks. So let me pray for you, Nolan, and then we'll get back into our praise and worship. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that uh, salvation comes to those who desire to know you and Paul said in Romans 10, how can, how can they get saved unless somebody is sent to give them the gospel? And we, we send people out all around the world. And Father, I pray for Nolan and his schooling. 
you have called him uh, as he believes in medical missions. And we want to we lift him up and be proactive. We, we want to do this precursor to missions and pray for him while he's in school. Be a blessing to him while he's there. Uh, train him up. Disciple him. Pour our lives into him so that we, when he goes out, we know that he is ready to absolutely face every challenge that this world will have, uh, knowing that the gospel will be hindered by uh, all of your enemies, Father. And I pray, God, that you would keep him encouraged, uh, keep him um, right on the path, that you would help him in his studies, help him not only with his schooling, but also in his studies of uh, your word so that he can evangelize his part of the world that you have called him to go and make disciples. We love you, Lord, and we just commit him to your care, and we just pray that you would continue to guide and direct his life. We love you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, buddy. Would you stand with us as we continue to worship the Lord?
you, praise team. If you would, open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We continue on with our Missions Emphasis Month, and we're talking about missions and what all that means and everything that's uh, and revolved around that. <clears throat> A man by the name of Leonidas Cheney was born on April 1st, that's no joke, 1883, in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He started out in the theater in his teens, but moved to California to do movies. Actually, he did silent movies. And according to the PBS American Masters of Theater collection, his official count stands at 157 movies. Is best known as Lon Chaney. Two of his best films were uh, Top Left, Phantom of the Opera, and then One Down and One Over, uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And of course, in 1923, he was given the title Man of a Thousand Faces. And I tell you what, this ugly woman right here, whew, that's crazy. I didn't know a guy could play an ugly woman. Oh, better not say that. That's <laughs> Anyway, moving on. But he was given that title, Man of a Thousand Faces, because he could transform himself into any character that he needed to be. He could do whatever he wanted. He could be whoever he wanted. And so even though he lived only to be 47 years old, his influence is still seen today in the horror movie genre. Matter of fact, his son was one of the biggest that was influenced by him. John 5, 19 says, what the son sees the father do, the son does in the same way. Lon Chaney Jr., for all you old school horror folks, uh, probably best remembered as the wolf man, but he was the only man to play all four of the iconic roles in classic horror movies. He played the mummy, Frankenstein, Dracula, and the Wolfman. And so uh, he played alongside some of the greats of their day. Of course, his father, Lon Chaney, was in silent films. Lon Chaney Jr. He was just getting into uh, having voices and uh, so forth and played with Bella Lugosi. You probably remember as one of the great uh, Draculas and Boris Karloff, who also played the mummy and Frankenstein. Matter of fact, you'll be hearing his voice if you listen to How the Grinch Stole Christmas, the old classic cartoon. He is actually the narrator, and he's the voice of the Grinch, both. And if you know the guy that sings the song, You're a Foul One, Mr. Grinch, he's actually the voice of Tony the Tiger on the Frosted Flakes commercials. Did you know that? See, people can be whatever they want to be. They do whatever they need to do uh, for life, for work, for whatever. And speaking in the same way, it's not just for uh, movies. Uh, it's also for sports, like football. I would say back in the day type of football. Uh, players played offense, they played defense, they played specialty. They pretty much did it all because that's what they had to do. And that was back in the day. Uh, like this guy, Eric Stotner. He played for, uh, he was a defensive tackle for the Steelers from 1950 through 1963. And one guy documented as they come into the huddle, his thumb was bent back to his wrist and bones were sticking out. And so this was at the beginning of the first quarter. So what they did is he just went offside, uh, grabbed some tape, taped it up, and played that way the whole game. And then after, after the game was over, went into the uh, huddle, took the tape off and said, Doc, I think I got a problem. Walt Garrison, running back for the Cowboys, 1966-1974, broke three ribs in the opening plays of the first quarter, was carried off the field, got right back up, went back onto the field, and rushed for over 100 yards that game. It's amazing, isn't it? Ray Nitschke, linebacker for the Green Bay Packers, 1960-1973, under the, the leadership of the great Vince Lombardi. Broken fingers, broken appendages, just tape them to another one. Get back in there, rub some dirt on it, you're good. He was drafted in the United States Army in 1961. 
And so he had to take weekend liberties from the military in order to play in the 62 season 12 of the 14 games. You do whatever is necessary. Ronnie Lott, cornerback, safety. Started for the most part, 49ers, played for other teams. But he got his finger caught in, uh, in between the helmet and the shoulder pads of uh, somebody's equipment, and um, it broke every bone in his finger. And so it never healed right. So you know what he did? He had his finger amputated so he wouldn't have any problems. So he could go back and do whatever it took. <laughs> Look, people do whatever is necessary to make sure they can effectively do their job, effectively do life, whatever. And my point is this. It's Missions Emphasis Month, and we need to get the gospel out. So we, too, need to do whatever's necessary to get that message to a lost and dying world. Amen? Let's get into our text this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 23, Paul says this. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, uh, not being without law toward God, but under the law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law to the weak. I became the weak that I may win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker of it with you. Tim Bongiorno, would you open us in a word of prayer? And we'll get into our study this morning. Amen. Thank you. So Paul said, though I am free, he said, I make myself a servant or a slave, basically, so that I can win more people for Christ. I would say that uh, probably the Apostle Paul could be called the original man of a thousand faces because he was all things to all men. To the Jew, he became a Jew, or he was a Jew. To the Gentile, he was a Gentile. To the weak, he became weak. He transformed himself into any type of character in order to win people to Jesus. We need to get a few things understood. If we're going to go and evangelize the world, we need to have some things in order. If we're going to support people to go evangelize the world, we ought to know what they believe. And there's a few things we got to get right. This is a training ground so that we can go out and fight. That's the battlefield. Amen? All right, so we need to train people up to go. So the first thing, you got to have the right message, right? You got to get the gospel right. I mean, that's the first thing. Matter of fact, when it came to the Apostle Paul, he got that gospel directly from the Lord Jesus. We went through this already in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. He said, but I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus gave him the direct gospel message. And so what was that message? That's the idea. You've got to get the message correct. You've got to get the gospel correct. What is the gospel? He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which you're saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And that's a scary thought. He goes on in verse 3 and 4, he says this, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, now understand, this is Paul writing this down to the Corinthian church when absolutely none of the New Testament was written down. 
Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. This isn't New Testament stuff. He's documenting Old Testament stuff. Man, you can preach Jesus from the Old Testament. So he says, Jesus died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Amen? In Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul says this. So if you confess that with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what you believe here, you'll confess here. Amen? Paul knew that message inside and out. Look, guys, you know that message. You know the gospel. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. That's the simplest message you could know. That's the first thing you need to have down is the right message, the correct gospel. The second thing is your motive. All right? Now, Paul had a real good motive. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Paul says, For we must all bef uh, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each of you may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We have been given a stewardship, right? And a stewardship is just you're taking care of somebody else's stuff, right? So as sons in the kingdom... We're to go out for the kingdom and take care of the things of dad's kingdom. And you will stand given account of everything that you do, whether it's good or whether it's bad. Amen? But here's the most important thing, and this is what we talked about last week, right? What's love got to do with it? Everything. It's got everything to do with it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, same chapter, verse 14 through 15, Paul says, for the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. You know, if you love Jesus, you shouldn't live for yourself. You should live for Jesus. Amen? If he died for you so that you could have heaven and eternal life, you should no longer live for yourself. You should live for Jesus. It's all about love, right? You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and so, knowing that, you ought to go out and spread the gospel for the kingdom because you love Jesus. Right? Isn't that what we said before? You love Jesus, you'll give, right? You don't love Jesus, you won't give. So if you don't love Jesus, you won't spread the gospel. And unfortunately, somebody's going to spend a place where they really didn't need to. Thirdly, you have to understand that the gospel is not for the pastors. Do you understand that? For the most part, people bring people to church and they're like, hey, hey, Danny, I brought him into church. There he goes, all yours. Uh, what? Why aren't you witnessing to him? Why aren't you pouring your life into him? You've got the gospel correct. You should be witnessing to him in, in your life. That's your sphere of influence. See, I can't go out and be influenced by all the people that you are influenced with in your life. But you can. And that's the whole point. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. He says this, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, because necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. It's for everybody, not just the pastors, right? Amen? Come on, amen? Okay, don't fall asleep on me yet, man. So... It's everybody's duty to go out and evangelize. It's not just for certain people. Fourthly, you should have great success in preaching the gospel. Unless you're afraid to uh, speak about, uh, well, yeah, that'd be the idea. Unless you're afraid of the gospel. Unless you're afraid to speak the gospel. Uh, don't be afraid to speak the gospel because there's power in there. Paul says in Romans 1, 16, he says this. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Can I tell you something? Hebrews uh, 4.12 says, God's word is quick, powerful, living, sharper than any two-edged sword. When you give the gospel based off of God's word, it's got power within itself. You're not going to try to coerce or try to do anything. It's the Holy Spirit's job. John chapter 16, Jesus says it's the Spirit's job to convict the world of sin. You just preach the gospel. 
Let the word of God do its powerful work in somebody's life. Fifthly, you got to find a uh, uh, tragedy. Or, uh, God, my English is a tragedy. I know that. <laughs> You've got to find a strategy. Paul had a strategy. Matter of fact, in Acts chapter uh, 18, verse 4, he, every time he went into a city, he, he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath, and he persuaded Jews and Greeks. So Paul had a method to his madness. He would go into a city, and the very first thing he would do is go to the synagogue. The very first thing he would do is go to the Jews. And then he would try to witness to them. And then he would go on to uh, the, the Gentiles. And, and so everywhere he went, he had a method. He had a strategy. He had some type of approach to give them the gospel. I think back in the olden days, that they, they did the Romans road. Nothing wrong with that. That's still a good way to evangelize people. But sometimes you might need another method. Sometimes you may need another strategy. Sometimes you may need... You know, to build a relationship a different way in order to give them the gospel. Have a method. Have something. And lastly, and probably the most important, you got to have a love for lost people in order to witness to them. Amen? Romans 1, 14 through 15, Paul says this, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks, to the barbarians, both to the wise, to the unwise. So as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. He was ready. He knew that he was a debtor to give them the gospel. You know, in our culture and in, in, uh, our day today, people are just in debt up to their eyeballs. They just, and they have no conviction over debt. I mean, it's just like, oh, that's just life. We're just, we're just supposed to be in debt. And so if that's the case, then guess what? That type of lifestyle, and we talk about culture, absolutely tells the church how, to, how it's supposed to live. And unfortunately, it shouldn't be like that, but it does. As culture changes, so does the church. It shouldn't, but it does. And so now we live in a, a day and age where debt is just normal. Well, everybody's a debt. Yeah, that's cool. You're in debt to get the gospel out. Well, that's okay, because we're in debt and everything else, so not a big deal. Look, we, we've got to have a love for lost people. And we talked about it last week, but 1 Corinthians 16, 14, Paul says, let everything that you do be done out of love. If you love Jesus, you'll give. If you don't love, you won't give. We're debtors to lost people. Do you love lost people? Because if you do, you'll give them the gospel. If you don't, Unfortunately, they may end up somewhere they don't need to because you've never opened your mouth because you've never spoke through the power of the gospel because there's power in, in the gospel. All right, so back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So we're talking about being all things to all men. And Paul says in verse 19, let's look at that. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant. That, that word servant is translated slave. I've made myself a slave that I might win the more. So Paul said, even though I'm free from the law, I'm free from doing all those things, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put myself back into bondage so that I can win lost people for Jesus. And the same idea is uh, used of Jesus. Matter of fact, in Mark chapter 10, verse 44 through 45, it says, Where, whoever of you desires to be first shall be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. That's the example set forth by Jesus. Sometimes it's going to take a sacrifice in order for you to witness for the gospel of Jesus. Do you sacrifice? How far are you willing to go to see that somebody come to Jesus? See that somebody come to salvation? How far are you willing to sacrifice so that somebody would accept Christ. Paul said in Romans chapter 9, verse 3, he said this, for my people, my Jewish, my Jewish brothers and sisters, he said, I would be willing to be forever cursed 
cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Is that your heart for lost people? Say, Lord, take my salvation away. I will be willing to die and burn in the lake of fire if it will save the nation of the United States. Is that your heart's attitude? Man, I don't know if I could say that, but Paul surely did. He loved his, his brethren. He loved his countrymen so much that he was willing to give up his salvation if it saved him. Are we willing to do that? Do you have a heart for lost people? You know it cost the Apostle Paul his life? It cost him being stoned, being whipped, being imprisoned, chained, shipwrecked, all that stuff. Because he knew he was a debtor to get that gospel out. Look at verse 20. 1 Corinthians 9, 20. Paul says, And to the Jew I became a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those that are under the law. Um, he had no problem going back into the Jewish legalistic system of keeping the Mosaic law in order to witness to some so that they could come to Christ. In Acts chapter 16, verse 1, we see Paul, he says, Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy. This was young Timothy who went on to pastor the church, uh, I think at uh, Ephesus. Um, but anyway, uh, he was the young pastor, and he was the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was a Greek. Okay, so now you got a half-breed. Verse 3 it says this, Paul wanted to have him go on with him, so he took him and he circumcised him. And so if you've been studying the book of Galatians with us, we've been talking about that salvation has nothing to do with anything you do. It's not about works. It's faith in Christ alone apart from anything. Amen? So why in the heck would Paul go and circumcise Timothy? That's under the law, right? Why would he do that? The end of verse 3 says this. Because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. See, in the synagogue, there was a wall of separation. A Jew and Gentile, there was a Gentile wall, and a Gentile was not allowed to go past uh, that wall. But he, his mother was a Jew, and so if he was circumcised, he would be able to witness to the Jews as a Jew. And so he did that not for his salvation, but so that he could witness to the Jews. Remember, Paul had a strategy. He had a method. He did whatever it took to witness to people. Now, never, 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 never compromise the word of God. Amen? Don't ever compromise the word of God. Do not ever become a drunk to go witness to the drunks. That's stupid. Don't ever become an adulterer so that you can witness to the adulterers. It's absolutely ridiculous. Never compromise the word of God. Understand what they're talking about. But he moves on to Gentiles as well. And this is us today. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. It's the only two people that the Bible talks about. And so in 1 Corinthians 9, 21, he says, To those who are without the law, it's like a Gentile, they weren't given the law to begin with. That was just Israel. As without a law, not being a, without a law toward God, but under the law toward Christ. Everybody's under uh, obligation to God, regardless of whether you're a Jew or Gentile. He says that I might win those who are without the law. His whole focus was to win people for Christ. To the Jew, he became a Jew. He was willing to uh, circumcise Timothy so that he could go in and win. To the Gentiles, he became a Gentile. Um, even though he knew meat sacrificed to idols uh, and, and wine, there was nothing wrong with them. But the people coming out of pagan religions, they knew that that, that meat was sacrificed to idols. And it was a rock of offense. So, so Paul became whatever he needed to so that he would not offend people to get that witness of the gospel out. In verse um, 22, he says, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. And then he finishes this in verse 22b. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. 
He's like, I did whatever's necessary in order to win some people for Christ. I have become a man of a thousand faces to try to do anything I could so that people could come to Christ. I've done whatever I could to find common ground so that we could witness to them. It's like witness. Uh, it's like Christmas. We, we want to witness at Christmas time, right? Well, and, and that's all great, but we know that Christmas has pagan origin, right? Everybody know that? We're not going to get into that. We're not going to say, everybody knows that stuff. We all know that there was a, a worship of Christmas trees. Yeah, sure. Okay, we all know that the origins of uh, uh, Roman paganism, uh, they, they worshiped the sun god, S-U-N, on December 25th, and it kind of, uh, you know, the Catholic Church tried to overdo that, and they did Christ Mass, and that's kind of where we get Christmas and some contexts, and there's other ways. And there's just so many things that have been a part of Christmas. But here's the idea. When we talk about Christmas, are we worshiping pagan gods at Christmas? Well, absolutely not. Are we worshiping God? The one true God? Sure. Well, why can't you do it? I mean, it's not like you're doing anything wrong. You're celebrating the birth of Jesus, even though he wasn't born on December 25th. We know that. It's not a big deal. All we're doing is celebrating his virgin birth, vitally important to our um, doctrines. Amen? So you take a doctrine that's vitally important, and you celebrate it throughout the world. Everybody celebrates Christmas, right? That's Matthew 7. That's a, that's a Matthew 7 issue, talking about judgment. That's Matthew 7. Now, when you want to take Christmas, and you want to put Santa beside the manger, that's a John 7 judgment. Never put Santa beside the manger. Amen? There's a fine line between that. But there's nothing wrong with celebrating Christmas because we practice the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? What a way to go out and sing carols and everything that, that proclaim that good news to the world. What a way to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, some people believe it is, but listen to Romans chapter 14, verse 5 and 6. We don't, want to, we don't want to worship pagan people. But look, Romans 14, Paul says, One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe it to the, uh, that day, to the Lord he does not observe it. And Matthew 7, judgment. If you think there's something wrong with celebrating Christmas on December 25th, don't celebrate it. That's up to you. Not a big deal. But if you want to, do it. Because you're celebrating the birth of Christ. Don't add any pagan or anything into it, right? If you want to say Xmas, you can say Xmas. Now, that'll offend somebody. <laughs> you want to say happy holidays, say happy holidays. But if you want to witness for the gospel of Christ, then you're going to have to use an opportunity and be all things to all men. Don't just try to say, oh, they're taking you know, Christmas out of happy holidays. Well, that has nothing to do with you making a disciple and giving them the gospel, right? You got to become all things to all men. Same things hold true with uh, Easter. We know that's Estra. The, I don't even know, care. I don't care. I don't care. I honestly don't care. But here's the idea. Is there anything wrong with celebrating Easter? No, because we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the most important event in your Christianity. You know that, right? Amen? In 1 Corinthians 15, that's where he gets the gospel presentation, 1 through 4. But in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 16 and 17, he says, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if he's not risen, then your faith is useless. And you're still in your sins and you die there. you got no chance of a resurrection. The resurrection is the most important event. The virgin birth is important as well. <laughs> Because if he was not born of a virgin, then he would have the sinful nature just like you and me, right? So that's important as well. But if he didn't rise from the dead, we have no hope. So look, we, we use everything that we possibly can. And so Matthew 7, you want to celebrate Easter? Celebrate it. You don't want to? Don't. That's fine. But like I said before, John 7, don't put the Easter bunny standing in front of the tomb. Amen? Come on now. That's what we've done. We've mixed all this stuff. 
So now everybody wants to take that tomb scene and just put the Easter bunny with eggs there. And they don't want to open that tomb and see what's not inside. All right. That goes on with Halloween. I've heard so many people say, a Christian should never celebrate Halloween. Do we celebrate Halloween? No. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know. I, I don't celebrate it. <laughs> I would say this. Don't do something that's going to cause somebody to be offended. But we're not offending people by having children come in to get candy. How is that offensive? And how are you worshiping demons? Now, they talk about All Hallows Eve and, uh, you know, the, yeah, I don't care. That's thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago. Don't care. What I'm cared about is right now. Because sometimes people won't come onto this property to come to a church service. But they will come bring their kids to get candy. And that's where we need to have smiling faces going, hey, man, I'm so thankful you're here. Here's some candy. Trick or treat. Oh, that's a cool costume, man. That's awesome, man. You know, hey, we got other kids here. Oh, yeah, you homeschool? Yeah, we got some homeschool moms here, too. Oh, you go to Madison? Yeah, we got some kids go to Madison. You go to Mansfield? Yeah, we got some kids. That's how you build relationships. You do whatever you need to do to get the gospel out. You become all things to all people. Amen? Amen. There she is. She's going to do big things for the Lord, I'm telling you right now. But whatever you do, You've got to do all things. Be all things to all men. In order to do this, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23. We'll close here. Paul says, this I do for the gospel's sake. What are you doing for the gospel's sake? Are you doing anything? Like I said, everybody's called to do something for the kingdom. What are you doing for the kingdom? Let me give you this, and we'll close on this one, actually. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus says this. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus had the authority of God the Father of the entire universe, and he says this in verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. This is one of the highly most misinterpreted verses in all the Bible. Well, there's tons of them, but... This is another one. Here's the idea, folks. The word go is a verb. It's plural in its nature, meaning more than one. And it is an action for everybody to perform. So when the Bible says you are to go, I would let me paraphrase this in the Zedeker translation. While you are on your way, go and make disciples of all nations. What do you mean, uh, while you're on your way? On your way to what? Anything. Do you get that? That verb, go. While you are on your way to the soccer field, go make disciples of all nations. While you're on your way to the football game, go make disciples of all nations. While you are on your way to your job or while you're at your job, Make disciples of all nations. While you are on vacation, go make disciples of all nations. While you are on the way, while you are along the way, with the authority of God the Father, heaven and earth, Jesus gave us, plural, us, everyone, the authority to go while we're going, as we go, while we're on the way, to go make disciples. And the Apostle Paul set the greatest example himself. But here's the idea. Evangelism doesn't just come by accident. You don't just stumble into evangelism. It has to be done on purpose. It comes to those who are discipling or disciplining themselves. Those that have self-denial. Those that are sacrificing, have self-control, and are ready to be used by God to give him glory while they are going. You have sacrifice? Got self-control? Do you have self-denial? Or are you just selfish? Let's pray. Father, thank you for 
your word. Thank you for the emphasis on just going and making disciples of all nations and supporting them financially, supporting them prayerfully, supporting just ourselves going out and doing it in our local community, which is also the mission field. God, may everything that we do give you honor and glory. And as we come to this invitation, Father, we just pray that you'd you just have your way, Lord. Just have your way. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.